of all the things you'd like more of in your life, I'll bet one of them is a minute, just a minute to think. Today on the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, we're going to talk about how we can make time and find time to think. This episode was recorded during our Virtual LeaderCon event, and you can learn more at virtualleadercon.com. But now, let's get on with it. Let's take some time to think. Are you ready? Let's get started. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to help you lead more confidently and make a bigger difference, both professionally and personally. This episode is brought to you by Kevin's Daily Newsletter. The Daily Newsletter is a short email delivered Monday through Friday, written to inspire, engage, and focus you on becoming the best person and leader you can be. Learn more and sign up at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash daily. And now here's your host, Kevin. We are dual purpose, everybody. Welcome back to the Remarkable, excuse me, welcome back to Virtual LeaderCon and the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We're so glad you're here. The smiling face next to me is Miss Juliet Funt. I'm going to talk to her. We're going to talk. We're going to explore an idea called a minute to think. How about no. how many would like to have that? A minute to think. Yeah, let, right. me, let me introduce Juliet to you. Juliet Font is a regular feature in top global media outlets, including Forbes, Fast Company. She is a renowned keynote speaker, a tough love advisor to the Fortune 500. How about that? Uh, as the founder and CEO of the CEO of the boutique efficiency firm, White Space at Work, she is an evangelist for freeing the potential of companies by unburdening them and their talent from busy work. Can I hear an amen? Her warm, relatable manner and actionable content earned her one of the highest ratings at the largest speaking event in the world. And no, contrary to popular belief, that was not yet Virtual LeaderCon. Uh, she has worked with Spotify, National Geographic, Anthem. I could go on and on and on, including Wells Fargo, Nike, Pepsi, Costco, ESPN. You can follow her at whitespaceatwork.com. All the resources are going to be down here. You know all that. She's written this brand new book called A Minute to Think. Now, right now, Juliet lives in New Zealand, and I want to know why. Um, but so I have a copy, and I said to her a minute ago, some of you have heard me say this, if I give, can I give a copy away, and then will you send me another one? She says, no, give away three. So what I'm going to tell you is she's going to send us three copies from New Zealand, and uh, right, or no, are they, not, are they going to from New Zealand or They're not? coming from the States. No, They're I'll coming from the States. So we'll get them, and then we'll, my point is, we'll get them, and then we'll send them. So it might take longer. Okay. The first one is going to Andres. I'm just saying, because I believe that Andres is in Argentina. Is that correct? Correct. And we're going to give Andres an ebook then that's really hard to send. <laughs> no, no, no. We're going to get it to him. Okay. Andres right. gets a copy. He deserves it. He needs it. He said earlier, his English was bad. And everyone said, no, it's not. It's just fine. My friend. All right. So Juliet, Tell me about your journey to this work. How did you end up in the business of helping organizations think about time and space and all that? I should just start with the fact that we rebranded the company with the book. So it's actually Juliet Fund Group and the website is julietfund.com. So no more white space at work. And moving on to the next chapter is very exciting. So maybe we'll go back to the first chapter now, which is what you asked about. I was an, a youth and education speaker 25 years ago, and I was doing the big rooms in the high schools, the mandatory assemblies where 1,000 out of 1,000 people don't want to be there, and um, started talking to teachers and adults about the busyness of youth, about how kids were too busy and overloaded and overwhelmed and going into college feeling like they didn't have a minute to think. Uh, and we're being sent somewhere where they were supposed to think. And over the years, that conversation shifted and shifted and shifted as all the parents went, you know, by the way, where I work, it feels exactly the same way. And that was how it started was corporate parents sitting in youth and education audiences 25 years ago going, everything that you're talking about is deeply a problem for me. Please help me. And so eventually I evolved out of doing kids and started doing grownups for for a 10 year speaking career where I focused on leadership and corporations and entrepreneurs and anyone really who was in a business where they were overloaded and overcommitted and they were over it and how we were going to help them get past that. 
And then 10 years ago, we turned that content that I'd been keynoting in into a company and a training program. And now we go in to make measurable behavior change because a wonderful thing about speaking, it's like a wheatgrass shot and you get this wonderful zhuzh of energy, but it's not the same as changing behaviors over time that can then be measured and sustained by groups. And that's what we're passionate about now. There you go. White Space is a fabulous book. I didn't have time. Uh, I, Y'all, I looked, I should say it this way. I looked for my copy this morning and I didn't find it, but I have the new book right here, A Minute to Think. So um, one of the things that you say in this book is that there's a false God called busyness. Can we just start there? We can. It is worshiped with big shrines everywhere we look. And there is a badge of honor we wear for busy and prizes we get for busy and accolades at work for seeming like we're checking off a million boxes. But there's an enormous problem, which is that activity and productivity are two different things. And just because we're flying through the day, moving every single second, doesn't mean at the end of the day that there has been any before and after transformation of a piece of work that we've gone and looked at one thing that was not as good and then at the end of the day, we've made it either better or bigger or more beautiful. That is not always happening. And so this confusion between I'm moving fast and activity. I'm doing work of value is activity and productivity is constantly tricking us into worshiping the wrong thing at work. Activity versus accomplishment, everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, so how many in the, in the chat, just tell us, I mean, I already know the answer, but I need you to chat. I need you to type. How many of you have had have ever said this? Well, if I could quit going to meetings, I could actually get something done. I mean, that's what we're saying. Yeah. Amen. Right? Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. Yes. My team isn't saying it. I'm looking for it's my team. Oh, my team is it's, saying it. Here they go. Right. And it's not just meetings, it's email, it's Dex, it's recording, it's I am, it's Slack, it's Yammer, it's chat. And at the end of the day, we row to Whitewater and we look up at I was going to say five. It's now at seven. We look up and say, did I do anything today? Did I, did I get anything done today that I could maybe feel that tiny spark of truly joyful pride about contribution? And that when that's missing, I mean, welcome to one enormous element of the great resignation. If you're going to torture me at work and I'm not going to feel any meeting, I'm out of here. That's, that's it. Joyful pride of accomplishment. Did you say accomplishment or did you joyful pride of accomplishment? I think, I think that you can, I said contribution. contribution. I think that, that that sense of, you know, I have this image. I don't know why I can't get this image out of my head, but I think about a person getting ready for their very first day of work, standing in front of their wardrobe, choosing their outfit. I think that is the most earnest and lovable image of every worker everywhere. And that is about because everyone has a spark inside of them that wants to contribute this beautiful spark that wants to make things better or different. And even if your job is just a paycheck, which we've, we've created some shame around, I go to work and I feed my family, which really bothers me. But even if your job is just a paycheck, that meaningful contribution is squashed by the way that work feels. Oh, the, I know you're going to love this question, Juliet. Tamara asks, okay. why do some people think, uh, why do some people seem to think that if we're sitting in our desk thinking we are not working it is some of the greatest work I need to do. I know this is like, let me, let me throw you a fastball. Tee it up, baby. Yes, this is, but just, you have to play this out, how the posture of thoughtfulness has lost its status. If you and me are probably, I'm guessing, in the same age ballpark, there was a time when you would walk, if you walked into your boss's desk in the office and they were thinking, let's say they had feet up on the desk and they were staring out a window, it was real quiet in there, you would go, oh, oh, I almost interrupted the golden hour. And you would back out really quietly because that was the moment where they were cooking the future of the company, the future of the products, the dream that they were bringing to life. Now, if someone is thinking, and we walk by them and we poke them. What are you working on? What are you working on? What are you doing? What are you doing? Why aren't you moving? Why can't I see blur when you're going in different places? And different? So we, it's, it's the entire posture of thoughtfulness has lost its clear value but the truth is that thoughtfulness changes everything and when we move toward more thoughtfulness and away from pure exertion amazing things happen in the products and results and strategy and creativity that we're able to produce that is so true um 
Dan asked a question, how do you see the future of engagement at work? How do you see the future of engagement at work? You know, it's funny how long we've been talking about the future of work and baby, it's here now, right? This is it. This is the moment where all the car parts are out on the driveway and we're reassembling, dismantling, changing, redesigning, hybrid, not hybrid. The spectacular goodness that's happening right now is that we have an opportunity to take all the things that have driven people crazy for decades and we have an opportunity to fix them because everything is dismantled so the future of work i see is an engaged one if we can have less conversations about where and more conversations about how the the where conversation is dominant right now where will we work and where will we sit and where will we sell real estate and where will we keep it and that's all important but it is actually only the second most important conversation the most important conversation is what aspects of the how of work have limited good people and tortured them for years and created misery in the workplace that we have an opportunity right now one at a time to examine dismantle and change and I see the future of that engagement coming from those conversations that smart leaders could have right now. Yeah, there's two parts to that. I, I love that. I've been saying that same thing, but not as elegantly as you. I love this where versus how piece uh, because it, the focus has been on, okay, what are we going to do? What's our policy going to be? What's our approach going to be? And I've been saying, even as you're making that decision, and that is, you got to make that decision. That's fine. Even as you're making it, how are you making it? And how will you transit? So it's it's not only how will it be when we get there, whatever there is, but it's how are we coming to that conclusion and how are we transitioning from here to that conclusion, wherever that, whatever that conclusion is. And I was just having that conversation this morning is that leadership needs to, you know, the step level meeting where if you've heard the term step level, yeah, where a leader will invite people below their direct reports to sit with them, right? but we need step levels meetings, plural. We need senior leadership sitting with three, four, five rungs down in the organization and saying, what's a day like for you? Does your family pay any prices for the way that work feels? Do you feel stressed and overloaded? Is work efficient? What's driving you crazy? These are the questions that if we could have real people answer to real executives, it, it, we wouldn't have to be undercover as a boss. We yeah, so I was just going to say that's sure. undercover boss right. without the makeup and the fake yeah. mustaches. Right, um, that's undercover boss. Yeah, just come on in. Not undercover. Right. How about the transparent boss instead of the yeah. undercover boss, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love and then that. that transparent boss, if they were transparent, probably the next thing that they would be willing to do is make a vulnerable and public admission of the wrongs that they have made into the organization. When we look at the answers of all those questions, we as leaders are going to see some things that are negative. And if we blame it on procedure or the industry or we can't help it or the economy, we won't garner the kind of trust that we want. But if we say, you know what, I slept on this and I'm partially responsible. I do send emails on Sunday night and expect immediate responses. And I do give you nine projects when really seven is appropriate. And when we talk about our own culpability in building cultures of overwhelm and overload and unnecessary busyness, there's this sweet, earnest realness that's unlocked. And then real people can start a dialogue that continues beyond that step levels meeting. And so that's what we want in this redesign is real dialogue, honest people, talking about when they're right, talking about when they're wrong. Yeah. Most of Stacy says most of our VPs have been, uh, have, have open office hours when anyone can come in and talk to them about anything, uh, but that can be intimidating, right? So now there's the psychological safety thing we've been talking about all week and all that. I have right. an important question to ask you, Juliet, that it cannot wait any longer. Okay. Why do we think everything is so urgent? Mm hmm uh, let's do another poll. Can we do another poll in the chat? How many yeah. of you can say yes if it feels like more than 50% of the things you're given are urgent? I just want to see where people are coming in. No, no, no. A few yes is always yes, yes, yes. So Dean was the outlier with one soul, happy no. Yeah, this is called, we call it hallucinated urgency. We are tripping all day long, imagining the urgency around us. And, and we bring it in on a visceral level so that that 
metronome of urgency kind of gets embedded in our bodies. So we're just moving fast from one thing to the next and pick, and it's just frantic. And the problem is that there's not a lot of spotlighting going on where leaders are helping people to say, I gave you six things. You may not psychically know which of those six things are most urgent. So I'm going to spotlight for you with a yellow verbal highlighter. It is numbers one and three that deserve your urgency. And the others, there it is. Or in the way you verbally do it, or you can physically do it. But the urgency is an enormous problem because no one knows where to exert more effort and less effort. We try then to exert effort equally everywhere. And that's a major contributor to the burnout that we're seeing everywhere is a frantic, urgent quality of all the tasks of the day. So there is a way around that, and that is to recognize and discuss that there are actually three levels of urgency. Things can be not time sensitive. We want to talk out loud about when things are not time sensitive. We want to cue teams to know, because they won't know. You think they would just know that it's not time sensitive, but they don't. Then there's tactically time sensitive, and that's when this is actually, yes, speed to response is tied to a business outcome. This is where we want you to move fast. And then the tricky catch-all third category is emotionally time sensitive. And this is when things are masquerading as tactically time sensitive, but really in reality, they're not. They are emotionally driven by curiosity, anxiety, uh, control, and so we just exert these emotions. That's when I call a sales VP and go, oh, by the way, what's happening with the Dell account on Tuesday when I'm getting a sales report on Friday? And there's absolutely no reason on gush green earth that I need to know on Tuesday. But I just thought about it. So I thought I'd right? ask. Just bing, just popped in my head. That's that hallucinated urgency. It can be when a request comes in on email. It just feels like if someone asks it, it's urgent. But when you have these three levels, you can begin to have dialogue with a team and that's where it gets exciting is they can start calling it out. Is this emotional? Is this tactical? Is this not time sensitive? And once you have language, like everything we teach, like everything we believe in, if you have a framework of shared language, you've just catapulted yourself into a better how in whatever category of work you're talking about. Deborah says, for my team, I give them the list of tasks and we agree together on the urgency from top to bottom. So they mm -hmm. aren't floundering. And I think for that, Deborah. Oh, yay. Second book. Deborah gets a book. Oh, you're counting. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, that's right. Um, we both have to that's count because they're not, not physically here. Matter. Like sometimes they're here. Um, and Deborah, if you don't know, you have to send your mailing address to info at virtualleadercon.com. Um, so um, I, I really love that tactically time sensitive. And there are, there are some people whose jobs, there is more of it in some people's jobs by nature, they're customer Absolutely. facing, they're doing certain sorts of things. Uh, so there's, there's some amount of that for some people that it has to be taken into account, but you know what? It also means that we as leaders have to be, have to help them know it and understand that. And we have to super value them for the fact that sometimes they have to tactically we need them to do that. And, and sometimes it's frustrating for them because they have to shift because the tactic is changing. You want to say, you want to say something about that? Yeah. And I was just going to say that, and we have to also understand that if you hold a certain level of position in an organization and something came out of your mouth, it gets assigned a higher level of urgency just from the fact that it came out of your mouth. Your Literally, name's on the door. No. Your name's on the paycheck. My name's on the door. My name's on the paycheck. And that, we got to be careful. Yeah. We got to be very, very careful. There's no doubt about that. Um, oh, we have another question. Let's see. Maybe, Let's maybe see. we already answered it. Let's see. Da, 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 da. We have constant urgent items on our list, says Josh. Is that the one you were answering? No, no. J Josh, I was just thinking, isn't that possible that some of us have got? Yeah, yeah so I, 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 I didn't hear it. I hadn't Absolutely. seen it yet, Josh. But do you want to say anything more about it, Juliet? Yeah, let's talk about the way that someone in a position like that should handle a constant stream of true tactical time sensitivity. If that is coming in at you, what that means is you need to clear other areas of work so you can be in, remember, if you ever played tennis, there's a thing called ready stance. 
You're just waiting for the ball, right? So if you know that all that tactical time, I have worked with a lot of people in media who have to check their email every six minutes. And there are really, really tactically time sensitive things that matter if it's six minutes or three minutes response. What that means is that a lot of other areas of your work have to be cleaned to make room for that ready stance. Aggressive on meetings, aggressive on email, aggressive on digital interruptions like chat, chat Slack, Yammer, I am. If you're going to be in ready stance to receive those tactical time sensitive items, you simply need more space. And that's that's a strategy that is not often talked about directly enough. There's sort of an illusion that you're supposed to be ready and doing all this other stuff at the same time, which is impossible. It's interesting. Um, we figured that out when we did virtual leader con last year. So we so inside baseball, everybody, we had, we have a Slack channel over here. We had we had a Slack channel that all of the team could con comment on, and so that they could connect with me. And last year, this was all brand new. We were using tools that we hadn't used, and in some ways, we were using mm -hmm. them other people, ways people weren't using them, and all that stuff. And there, but there was also all this other stuff that happened that I didn't need to hear. And so this channel, I couldn't follow it. So this year, so then like last year on day two, there was a second channel and this isn't what it's called, but basically is only give, only put stuff here. If it, if Kevin needs to know it during the, the Kevin channel, yeah. that's, that's not right. what it's called. That's too long to put in a Slack channel, but that's what it is. Now there's another channel for them to all say, Oh my gosh, the, two sessions ago, this thing didn't work. And so I'm sure it was furious, but not the not Kevin channel versus the Kevin sees this channel. That's exactly what, <laughs> but what it did was it gave me space realistically to stay in what I needed to be in, which was that this chat, this person that's with me, this camera, all that stuff, rather than that. And, and that first day last year, that was really hard because I didn't have space. Well, let's use it as a metaphor. So you're doing a live event for which you're looking into a camera, making contact with a virtual audience. In, in the right column, all sorts of stuff is happening, some of which is necessary for you to see and some not. This is not unsimilar, dissimilar to a regular old person anywhere working. And they're looking in the camera, which is their equivalent, is they're trying to stare at meaningful, high value work all day long. But in the periphery, all the stuff is happening, all these emails and interruptions and IMs and Slack and Yammer. It's the same thing. It's just pulling us off of our focus. And when teams get together to talk about this as an overt problem, they can begin solving it through, uh, as an example, the three levels, but other kinds of open dialogue. Yeah, Angie, I think has just come up with a new process for our team, which I love. But I want to ask April's question, which I think you just oh, yeah. kind of answered. But I want to ask April's question, and then she gets the third copy of the book, okay? Yeah. Um, what are some examples of ways you can clean up your other work areas, areas of work, so you can be in ready stance? April, great, the book. great question. Great question. So the, um, make it shine. Go like this. <laughs> well, that, when we were um, in the green room, I went like this. She goes, I do yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah, my little talisman. That's the pause sign is the little talisman you can rub. The, um, the areas of work that most need to be cleaned. If we had to triage what are the most intrusive time suckers in the day of the most people, it would obviously be emails and meetings. So maybe we should do a little for each sure. in the sure. cleaning department. Um, email has to be compartmentalized into two areas. There are two ways that you clean email. You can touch it less or you can compose it better. If it's better written, it's easier to read, it takes less time, it makes people's job easier. And if you touch it less, there are less cumulative minutes per day that you're separated from ready stance. Let's just call it ready stance. And of, we could obviously do a 90 minute session on each one, but let's just do one tool each. So for email, let's talk about the yellow list. The yellow list is the most aggressive way to reduce email quantity as a team. Here's what it is. It's just a document that you keep in your computer for each person that you deal with frequently. So I would have Kevin yellow list. If we work together, he would have Juliet yellow list as a document. Every time I'm about to send Kevin a digital communication, I insert a little thoughtfulness in between. And I say, first of all, is this time sensitive? Because if it really is, it doesn't belong in a digital frame. It should be a call or a text. If I really need to get Kevin, I'm gonna call or text him. Let's say it's not time sensitive or it's medium time sensitive. I am going to see if it belongs in a digital frame. That means, does it have things that are digital? Does it have an attachment or a CC or a forward or a link? If it doesn't, I'll just probably put it on my yellow list. 
And as my yellow list accumulates, it'll get a little longer and I'll go, hey, Kevin, can we have a yellow list debrief? And we'll get on the phone and bing, 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 or Zoom. And we'll go through it in 10 seconds. No CCs, can't CC someone on a conversation. One of the great benefits. Uh, no long threads as people try to work out complex issues via a digital frame, which doesn't work. And yes, some things need to be in writing, but by and large, you can compartmentalize so much of what was previously email into this wonderful tool. You can have a 2D yellow list where you just write things and share them and you read them. You can have a 3D yellow list where you discuss them, but getting it out of email is a major, major win and it will help you touch it less. So before we go to meetings, just hold on. Before y'all, if you all were with me earlier, and I said that with my with everybody on my team, they have a Kevin list, and I have an Adrian list. If it's Adrian, it's the same yeah. exact thing, and we're not yeah. interrupting each other, and we're not using the wrong media for the communication. It is this will change your life. It's huge. It's go huge it. the amount that it takes down. Okay, so now let's talk about meetings for a second. There are also sort of two focal points for meetings. There's the moment before we invite and the moment before we accept. Because if we really wanna be in ready stance, we have to have just plain less. We don't have time today to go into quality of meeting. Let's just get some of them off the calendar. So the moment before you invite, if you're a meeting inviter, it's really critical to have a thoughtful moment again, kind of a theme you'll see recurring. You take a minute to think, you say, who am I inviting just for FaceTime, politics, just to be safe, because I didn't really think about it. How many people are on this invitee list that really haven't been mindfully invited? And on the accepting side, you realize that an invitation is not a subpoena. And if you have dialogue within your team, you can have, there's a lot of different ways to, to, re, to respond to someone inviting you somewhere. One of them is yes. One of them is no, we have to teach teams to politely decline. You say, I found that I'm not gonna really be serving the business by attending this meeting. And there are, that's a, I got a myriad of subtleties. We can unpack that. You might need coaching. You might need a helper to do that. We also have two other ways of responding that we advocate in a world of our, of our design, a white space world. You can also send a sub, which means Kevin can't go, but Juliet could go instead of Kevin. That works and gets to cross-train Juliet in certain circumstances. How wonderful is that? FaceTime new opportunities for Juliet. And as then my very- By the way, as long as I tell Juliet why I'm asking her to go, and as long as the people whose meetings knows that that's why she's going in. So, I mean, yeah. there's there's a whole bunch of subtleties we don't have time to unpack, but that is so good. That is so good. Yes. I mean, all, I, not, not just that part, but the whole thing. You see it in the chat. Two people on my team are already saying a meeting invitation is not a subpoena. Not a subpoena, that, baby. That yeah, that's feedback to Kevin. I don't know. Um, well, that, you know, and I will say it's very important to say I had a senior executive that we interviewed for this book who got a little excited about opting out of meetings. He opted out and he found that he had some information that the team didn't have and they lost a lot of money in that meeting. So the mindfulness of when you leave, you have to be really cautious. If you're super duper high up in the organization, there has to be a purposeful download of the background and the information that you have that others don't know. So there is a little thoughtfulness that goes into it. But by and large, we see in our research with clients about 30% of meetings being recorded at a minimum as being unnecessary, defined as not serving the person and not serving the business. So we have to learn how to do this. And then the last one, which I love arguably more than any of our other meeting techniques, although they're all my favorite, they're like children and you don't really pick between them, um, is the idea of being on call for a meeting. So try this on for size. You are like a doctor with a pager. You sit at your desk and you do other quiet work. You can't be on a phone call or a Zoom because that's hard to interrupt, but you just get stuff done. And then you sit there during the meeting slot on call. That is your status for the meeting need in case they need you. Then there's one piece of data or one vote or five minutes that they need you for. They ping you, you come in, you go out, you just got 45 minutes of extra work done during the time that you would have been waiting for the minute where they say, Kevin, can you now tell us about blank? The other so thing that, that I do as a leader... Critical. The other thing, I'm sorry, the other thing I do as a leader, and I we need to wrap up because I need to honor your time, and I don't even know what time it is in New Zealand. Um, but 
Uh, the other thing I do as a leader sometimes is I'm needed to sort of set context and then I should go. In fact, I'd be better off if I'm not there. Yes. So a lot of times I'm in the meeting for the first three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, and then I'm gone. They don't want me or need me. Um, they're really good. Uh, because this is also a podcast, I have a couple of questions I usually ask my podcast guests. Will you, will you indulge me for like two more minutes? Of course. I'm good. I'm good and good. Question number one. You, you are the queen of the white space. My question is, what do you do for fun? What do you do for fun? Baking, parties, and now gardening. We're working on gardening, but I'm really just in my infant stage of getting into it. But my favorite thing in the whole world is to arrange get-togethers, potlucks, parties. We have to meter out how many we can do per month because the same group of people gets tired of being invited. Um, but I love socializing and baking is my big go-to hobby. Second question. Um, what are you reading right now? What's, tell us something you're reading or something you've read re recently. Prince of Tides. Have you read Prince of Tides? I have not. I, it's been, you know, it's one of those books that you know is around for a million years. Every single page is a sumptuous, delicious morsel. And every single time that I get to talk about fiction on a business podcast, is a win for the world because we need more fiction. It is one of the most beautiful methods of departing, of creating a parallel happy universe for our work world. And so Prince of Tides, get it now at a bookstore near you. Uh, Juliet Funk, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Such a pleasure. Thank you. you. It was really fun. No, I love we've, we've done we've done we did a podcast once with the other book a long time ago. We actually met once. We know how tall each other are uh, in Arizona <laughs> a number of years ago. It is so good to see you. I'm so glad you're well. Uh, I'm so glad for this new book. I'm so excited for the three people that want a copy and all the rest Thank of you. you. It needs to go on your list. And all of you that are that are watching and listening to this as the part of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, we're so glad that you've joined us as well. Uh, you can join us again another week because we'll be back. I promise you that. And for all of you that are here for the for Virtual Leader Con, you know what we're going to do. They're all thanking you. You see all that? You see all that love over there? I'm watching it. Um, I love it. You all know the deal. We're going to scroll down. You're going to click to the next thing. I'm going to close this. Juliet's going to go bye-bye. And see I'll see later. you all in a couple minutes.